I'm Mike Sham from the Johannesburg International Flower Show and welcome to the GIFS Flower Hour. We will be bringing the Johannesburg International Flower Show to you. We'll be seeing some of South Africa's best floral talent. Floral artists will be doing demonstrations for you. Landscapers will be showing us some of their gardens. You will be entertained. So we want you to sit back and enjoy our first journey as we went to visit Andy DeVette at the Allo Farm in Brits. Enjoy this. People think the aloe farm is only about aloes. It's not. We are fanatical about all sorts of different, especially indigenous plants. We also dabble in all sorts of different things, like we do bonsais as well. This is one that we've been working on for 30 years. It's coming to, it's got the real African style, which is not really oriental. This is um, developed in Africa by South Africans. The style of the umbrella tree, which is so synonymous with the African landscape. So this tree now, we've got the structure right after 30 years, but now the ramification, the um, finer branching, we're going to still be developing. But that will that'll ta take a lot quicker. That won't take so long. Um, we use wires to tie the branches down to give us a perfect shape. What people don't know is that bonsais needn't have to only be big trees. You could also use succulents to make amazing bonsais. Now, this is a spectrum. That's a very old spectrum. Uh, that one is uh, about 25 years old. And then look at this crassula. If you look at the detail of that. And that tree was about five years old only, so you could actually shortcut the whole process and if you go on holiday the tree will wait for you to come back to water it. Welcome to our bush garden. The idea with this bush garden was to show people pure species of our indigenous plants. There's a lot of the different aloe species in there and it's just like a mini botanical gardens where you can actually come and walk around and just enjoy yourself. This is Aloe spectabilis. Aloe spectabilis is, um, is one of the species and that's why th this garden is so important, is to actually show people the exact species that they found in the bush. An important thing to remember about aloes is they flower in the middle of winter. The reason for that is that the bird, birds need nourishment in winter. So they come and collect the nectar and the bees need the pollen in winter. So by removing them from the felt is, is devastating to the, to the habitat because the birds absolutely rely on them. And in turn the birds also pollinate the aloes which is also a great uh, symbiotic relationship. What we like doing at the aloe farm is to create new plant varieties for the industry as a whole. So this is two examples. This one is called goldfish. It flowers golden yellow and it'll flower throughout the year. So it's a lovely little pot plant aloe. And then one of my favorites that we released this year is called Marilyn. Now Marilyn has got beautiful little open flowers. 
like Marilyn Monroe's dress, that was the inspiration to give us this plant its name. Very popular. This is an example of our breeding. This is Agapanthus bingo white and bingo blue. Uh, they are being sold worldwide already. This is um, just to show you this, we're in midwinter and these are flowering now. So part of our, our um, uh, uh, objectives, one of our main objectives is to expand the flowering season of a plant. So Agapanthus traditionally only flower in October end of October, November, once a year. So we've got these now flowering the whole year. It's a scientific breeding program and it's taken a long time to be able to, breed, to, to expand that breeding season. One of our objectives is to try and create the perfect black agapanthus. We have clear objectives of what we're trying to create. How's that? And what about pink? How cool would that be? Many of our indigenous plants are being bred overseas in the Northern Hemisphere and thus they are not so suitable for our drier, hot climate. So we have embarked to rebreed a lot of these things starting from scratch. This is our selection of I think about after eight generations or ten generations of osteospermum breeding and um, you can see the lovely colors we're starting to get but this is still a work in progress. We will still improve on this dramatically. Our breeding program started in 1973, so uh, the whole objective is to create plants that are good proportion and wow in color. So masses of flower on a smallish plant in comparison to the flower show and all in the different colors. So we breed not only for the public but we also breed for the landscape industry so we have a great variety of different plants that the landscapers can use in mass planting. So the objective is to use these um, drought resistant plants all over the country in bigger projects as well so that we can draw birds and bees back to the gardens again. I'm Andy DeVette, thank you for joining us. You can also get our plants from our CND nursery and thank you for joining the International Flower Show this year. Next year you'll be able to do it real.
Ruth and I'm from Rare and Air Plants and Gifts here in KZN. We're a specialist Tillandsia nursery. Air plants are becoming increasingly popular and they're a great addition to your home or garden. However, they are sometimes a little misunderstood. So today I'd like to give you a better understanding of how to care for them and show you some creative ways to use them. Firstly, what is an air plant? There are lots of different kinds of epiphytic plants that grow without soil, but the plants that are usually described as air plants are from the Tillandsia genus from the South American Bromeliaceae family. Tillandsias are different from most other plants because they absorb the majority of their water and nutrients through their leaves rather than their roots. The roots are mainly used for anchorage to hold them onto a tree or a rock face in nature. And there are several species that rarely root at all. This makes Tillandsias incredibly versatile. You can mount them or hang them almost anywhere. So how do you look after your Tillandsias? Tillandsias are low maintenance plants, but no plant is no maintenance. Tillandsias don't absorb atmospheric moisture as some people believe. Their leaves need to be wet in order for the plant to absorb the moisture. So they'd need regular water if they aren't getting rain or dew out in your garden. You can water them by spraying with a hose, spraying them with a uh, hand sprayer, or even submerge the whole plant in a bowl of water for around 30 minutes. What is important is that the plant dries out within around four hours of being watered and that they don't sit in a wet spot. So if you're keeping them in a glass terrarium, take them out of the glass to water, shake them off and then put them back in. You don't want water sitting in the bottom of your container. The plants also like plenty of bright light and good air circulation. One of the most common mistakes is to put them inside in a dark room or underneath a covering where they don't get enough light. A few hours of bright light every day is very important. They're nutrient scavengers, so they don't uh, get a lot, require a lot of nutrients and you don't have to feed them. But if you give them a monthly dose with a general liquid fertilizer at a quarter strength of whatever you usually use, then that will really help your plants to thrive and grow and flower and hopefully produce pups. Another misnomer really about Tillandsias is that they're all the same, they're pretty boring. There are actually over 700 species of Tillandsias and even more cultivars and forms and hybrids. So they're certainly not all the same. They grow in a range of climates from quite high up in altitudes, in cloud forests, against the shoreline. And so there's a lot of different plants that will grow pretty much in any climate that you can think of. And they're also very adaptable. The variety of climates and positions that they grow in is reflected in the colours, shapes and sizes of the plants. Um, and there's lots and lots of different varieties. In general, there are two kinds, the xeric and the mesic. Xeric plants are similar to this Tillandsia harrisi, or here we've got a Tillandsia gardneri. These are the more grey varieties. You'll see these uh, greyish parts on them that almost look slightly hairy on some varieties are trichomes. This is what the plant used to pull the water into the leaf and hold it against the leaf. So the greyer, silvery plants are usually the more xeric varieties and they like more bright light and drier conditions. The fleshier, greener varieties, such as this Tillandsia brachycolos, where you can see there are very few of the visible trichomes, they prefer it in a mesic environment. So they live in forests, so slightly less full light, filtered light rather than full sun, and a little bit more humidity and water. Here's another variety, Tillandsia butsi. Again, you can't see many trichomes on here, it's more green coloured, so this is a more mesic variety. There are other plants that have fine, delicate leaves. So you get things like this Fuxi Gardnera, very soft, fine, delicate leaves, or here, a larger variety, but again, fine leaf, Tillandsia junkia. The fine leaf varieties tend to like extra good airflow. So that's a good sign that you need to keep it somewhere where it's gonna get lots and lots of airflow. 
terms of size, you also get plants that grow very large. This is an example of Tillandsia xerographica, which can grow very big and can grow perhaps even up to 20 or 30 years before it flowers. We also get other larger and more robust stiff forms, such as this Tillandsia uh, tricolor. Again, stiff leaves, um, a more robust form than the fine leaf varieties. Uh, the other sort of main shape that we get with Tillandsias is bulbous forms, where you get what we refer to as a pseudo bulb, so this chunky bit at the bottom. This one is Tillandsia bulbosa, and these can even get very large, such as this Tillandsia erlesiana. Again, this bulbous form. Something to watch with the bulbous forms is that they can sometimes trap water in between the leaves around this bulbous shape. And so a good way to mount them or use them is at an angle or upside down just to let any water drain out of there. Although they will go quite happily up, um, up ways as long as you just watch that no water sits in between those leaves. There's also a huge variety of colours as well as the greys and the greens. Some of the plants actually change colour depending on their life cycle. Here we've got a great example of this. This is Tillandsia ionantha. The plants are usually this greenish colour, but then in bright light and before the plant flowers, the leaves flush this beautiful pinkish red shade before they push out the flowers. And in nature, this is a way of attracting hummingbirds to the plant to pollinate it. Another criticism that I hear sometimes of air plants is that they're really foliage, background plants, they don't really have significant flowers. But this definitely isn't true. All Tillandsias are capable of flowering. Some, like the Xerographica we looked at, will grow very large over several years before they flower. Others reproduce quite easily by making lots of vegetative pups and so don't really bother to flower as frequently. But all flowers, can, all Tillandsias can flower and most do and they have some have very beautiful showy inflorescences. This is a great example. This is Tillandsia fasciculata and these are the flower spikes. The showiest plant often of a Tillandsia bloom is actually the bracts of the flower spike and the petals that come out often one at a time are less showy and significant. Another great example here is this Tillandsia chiapensis. You can see here these are the spent petals so they'll just open one flower at a time and here is a new petal just starting to form. A beautiful spike that's formed over several months and will continue to be attractive long after the petals have gone and when it starts to form seeds. There's also less showy but equally pretty flowers such as this Tillandsia tenuifolia. Tenuifolias, Strictas and Aeranthos all have a similar type of flower, although slightly different, often in pinks and purples and blue shades and they make a really fabulous beginner air plant. They flower reliably, the garden's full of tenuifolia at this moment in time, sort of very early spring and every time the plant flowers it will produce pups so then the plant is going to increase in size. These pups grow much much more quickly than a seed grown plant. A seed grown Tillandsia will take about six years from seed to a a reasonable size plant. Um, the pups will usually get to almost the adult size in around a year, depending on the species. And some plants will pup quite vociferously and have lots and lots of different pups. Once the pups are about a third the size of the parent plant, you can remove it from the parent. The parent will gradually die back or, as in this case, you can leave the pups to form clumps and then they flower and they make pups and you get a beautiful big showpiece plant within a few seasons. That's a general introduction to how to look after your air plants and how they work. But what I'd like to show you now is a good way to display your plants. They can be hung on wire or fishing braid. They can be mounted on pieces of wood or onto even a, a stone, as we've done here with this Tillandsia tectorum. Or you can hang them in baskets, as I showed you with the other plant earlier on. Uh, one thing that we like to do is mount them onto pieces of wood, and to do that, we use glue. And I'd like to demonstrate that for you now. 
Okay, I'm going to demonstrate for you now how you would go about mounting your plant on a piece of wood. In this case, I've chosen this really attractive decorative piece of driftwood that we're going to use um, to show off our plants. And today I'm going to use glue to mount the plants. You can tie your plants using stockings or coated wire. What's really important is not to use anything with copper in. Solantias um, find to copper toxic and the plant will quite quickly shrivel up and die off. But I'm going to show you how to use glue. I'm going to do one and then we'll talk about it as we do the others. So first of all, I've got a Talantia Ionantha. I'm going to take some of the dead leaves off the bottom because those are going to fall off. You're going to place the glue, not on the root where it comes out, but on a clean piece of plant just to the side here. And then you're going to put it onto the piece of wood. So I've got here a piece of driftwood and we're going to fasten the plant on at the top here. So the driftwood hasn't come straight off the beach. Okay, now I'm going to demonstrate to you how we would mount it onto a piece of wood. You could tie a plant on with stockings or coated wire. Most important is that there's no to uh, copper. Copper's toxic to Tillandsias and they'll quite quickly shrivel up and die. So no treated wood, no copper wire, no paint with copper in. And if you're going to use a piece of driftwood like this, make sure it's not come straight off the beach. We don't want it full of salts. So either inland driftwood or one that you've left outside for a season or so to have a good uh, leach and get rid of all the salts. I'm going to demonstrate how to glue and then we'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of gluing. Here's a Tillandsi Ionantha I'm going to fasten on. I've removed any dead leaves from around the base and we're going to pop the glue on here just to the side of the roots, not absolutely on the roots. The glue I'm using here is a waterproof uh, glue. This one's called E6000, but any waterproof glue will do. This is a beading glue, so it's quite thick and sticky um, and it makes that makes it quite easy to use. So I've just popped a piece onto the plant then I'm going to push the plant onto the piece of wood like that in the spot where I want it to be and then I'm just going to take a piece of plastic coated wire and I'm just going to hold it down like that. The plants are fairly robust so you don't have to be too too gentle. I'm just going to twist that arm and that's just going to hold it on until the glue dries. So I'm going to leave it for 24 hours. And then I'm going to turn it around and move on to the next one. Some people don't like to use glue. It seems unnatural or they're concerned that it's bad for the plant. I wouldn't use silicon or super glue. Um, but the, any waterproof craft glue will definitely work really well. And I find it has a really... Um, great aesthetic look. You obviously can't see the plants where they're fastened on. And it holds them on nice and tightly. It's weatherproof. And I think it's important to remember that you're just gluing it on until... I'm just going to fasten that down onto there like that. You're just holding it on until the roots take over. So you can see, for example, here, this tectorum was glued initially onto this rock. Now the roots have grown over and the roots are gluing themselves on to the rock. The plant's in a happy spot. It wants to stay there. So it sends out roots to hold it onto the, onto the um, wood or rock that it's growing on. So the glue's just there until your plant is in a happy spot and it's going to stay there all by itself. Okay, and then we're going to have a look. Here's a Talantia fuxi. This is fuxi bargracilis. Again, just a blob of glue on the bottom. And then we fasten it on. Push it down firmly. Use a piece of wire. You can see here the wire is a little bit fiddly and to get wire in and do it in a way where you can't see the um, wire is quite difficult. 
So the glue is a great alternative so that you can really put it on, get held on nice and fast um, and then you can't see it and then the plant will grow over. Okay, I'm going to carry on with that and then I'll show you the finished piece a little bit later. Okay, I've finished gluing the pieces on, so I'm going to show you. We've got a Talantia parasy fastened in here. We've got a Talantia foxy tucked around the other side. We've got an iron anther and a couple more iron anthers here. These are all plants with similar light and watering needs. So if you're going to keep it like this, you want to use ones that like the same sort of um, climate or, or conditions. I'll leave it overnight or 24 hours with the uh, wire on and allow the glue to dry and then it can go outside in the garden, on your veranda, on your patio or as a display piece in the home. The wood pieces um, are really easy to water, just spray it with the hose when you're in the garden. You don't need to be too precious about it. And something like this makes a great centrepiece um, for a wedding or something like that. But if you do do that, I would recommend you make it in advance and then allow the plants to grow on so that when it's sitting on your table, it's clearly a growing piece of um, plant art rather than just something that you've recently fastened together. I hope you've enjoyed our short introduction. You can find out more on our website and thank you very much.